The following is an interview with Mr. Marvin Flitcroft, F-L-I-T-C-R-O-F-T, 102 Woodmont Circle, Clinton, Tennessee. Interview conducted September 21st, correction, September 20th, 1995, by Dr. Charles Johnson, Director, Center for the Study of War and Society. Interview at Mr. Flitcroft's home. Thank you. Just kind of give you a little bit of a bit of a background. Sure, go ahead. I <coughs> had a service station before the war. Was that pick it all up? In? And uh, <coughs> so the National Guard troop in, in this little town in Medford, Oregon, where I graduated. Uh -huh. When did when did you graduate from high school? Thirty six. Thirty six. And I was born in seventeen. And. Uh, <coughs> selling gas to them. So they wanted me to join the National Guard. Mm -hmm. So I did, and we had a lot of fun going out on the weekends, rifle rings and things mm -hmm. like that, you know. And we were all real triangulation and all that stuff. What, um, what sort of an outfit was it, the Guard? It was the 3rd Battalion Headquarters of the, of the 41st, 186 of the 41st Division. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get into the tough fighting like the rifle and the mortar companies did, you know. Well, anybody that was in the Pacific had, yeah, had that's all sorts right. of problems. But then I, I just wanted you to know that. Mm -hmm. But it, it was real important, and we got into some... Whenever they got into a tough place, everybody was fighting, you mm -hmm. know. It didn't, it didn't like other wars have been. And uh, one thing you was interested was your... Was it 31st or 32nd Division? Yeah, I was, um, I was involved when I was in the Guard in the 46th Infantry Division, which is what the 32nd became after the war. Uh -huh. um, we had people in, I joined the Guard in 52, and we had people in my company, we were an anti-aircraft outfit, uh -huh. um, who were World War II veterans yeah. and had been in the old 32nd Division and then came back to Michigan and uh, joined the, um, the 46th. Well, you see, you mentioned the 32nd Division, mm -hmm. and so I I didn't realize, you wondered how this was important, mm -hmm. how, what's your 32nd. Now, the 32nd went into New Guinea ahead of us. Mm -hmm. They were fighting over there, and we come over to Australia to relieve them, I guess. Yeah. Because we thought, I think, I believe they thought that they would be invading Australia. There certainly was a fear of that. And yeah. I think it would have been, but with the Coral Sea battle right off the coast of New Guinea and Australia, mm -hmm. yeah. we won that battle, and that was a battle of aircraft carriers for yeah. most part. Right. Because yeah. most of our battleships was lost in the Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands. Right. So no. we was kind of worried about that. Yeah, I'm and sure. And we was coming in when they was when that battle was that going battle. on. So we went clear down below New Zealand and everything, come clear back into Melbourne oh, uh -huh. to, to stay away from that right. airplanes right. and things, see. So you Sneaking uh, in the back door. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you joined the, the guard in 36, 37? No, that was, uh, well, I guess it had been about 38. I'd 38. worked uh, two or three years up to the coast and mm -hmm. had money in the bank, and so I bought a service station. Well, that's, that's unusual for the Depression. That's, um, well, I'm kind of an unusual man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an honor student, but then I, I got a lot of common sense, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what brought me back. So but your, your division helped us know in the people that had any sense it did. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> when we went to New Guinea, they were fighting for an airport up there. So if we could get the planes to land troops up there, we could relieve them, mm -hmm. rather than having to go clear over a 10,000 foot mountain and take months to, mm -hmm. to walk over. That's over what, the old Stanley Mountains? Over the old Stanley. That's what they, they fought over that mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we was waiting there, <coughs> They sent some, I think, I think a lot of MacArthur 
and we, it was MacArthur's men over mm -hmm. there. And uh, he didn't want men to get killed. So he, your leaders up above, it's passed down. They sent these sergeants, not lieutenants, but sergeants back to Port Moresby to talk to us. And they said, men, if you ever want to go home, just do what we tell you. There'll be other men if you have, when you're here, if you're here very long, till you can get out of here. We'll come and talk to you. And uh, said, all that you've been trained in the army, forget it. Forget everything you've ever been told. This is altogether different. And you know, if the men could have just got that point, that was a thing. You know, if you want to, well, I won't say that. But uh, <clears throat> what did they? What did they tell you you needed to do rather than what you'd been trained to do? Well, they said, you know, in your childhood days, you're from the West Coast. You probably played cowboy and Indians. And I said, everybody said, oh yeah, we played cowboys and Indians. Well, then, you just get behind a stump, get behind a tree, get behind a rock, hit the dirt, and crawl into that hole that's there. <laughs> Make a hole as you go in or something, you know. Mm -hmm. You just look out for yourself, everybody. It's every man for himself in a case like that. And I'd like to mention at this time, was Eichelberger, was that your mm -hmm. general? Uh, yeah, he came in and took over command of the division from Harding. Harding yeah. was relieved. MacArthur sent in Eichelberger. Well, I don't know about mm -hmm. that, but I'd just like to say that we had a place up past Dobadura, and uh, it was up past Oro Bay. Oro Bay was out on this side, Dobadura. And uh, the 32nd sent a patrol up through this cunha grass, grew five or six feet tall, and it just cut your clothes. The sharp edges. Sharp, yeah. And there was a trail up through there that so it took the trail. And the Japanese was all the way around this this big opening, see, in the trees and everything. Went up through there, and the Japanese let them get clear up in the middle, and then they wiped them out. So they sent a platoon up, and they wiped them out. They sent a company up, and they wiped them out. So I, don't, I think they might have sent a battalion. I'm not sure what the records will show. The records will probably never show anything like this here. But this is to the best of my knowledge. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of crosses out there, and we call it Eichelberger Square. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a reminder to us. Mm -hmm. so Be careful, man. Now, now, being in the 3rd Battalion headquarters, I was able to do a lot of things because I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. That's what I... <clears throat> what I've become. I've been a religious man all my life and I, I believe that we're here to serve others and help other people so I didn't want to be a lieutenant or anything. I didn't want to be in charge of a lot of stuff. So when we needed a place across the jungle we went out and said how can we get from here to there? We need to go over to the Oro Bay. They would come the, a tugboat company would bring gasoline up on barges and dump it in the ocean and it would wash in, see. Mm -hmm. And we needed jeeps to go through this because we didn't have any trucks. They did have a few jeeps. We'd have to roll that up onto <coughs> to trailers and take two or three and bring them over. And I said, the only way you're going to get through this swamp is to fall these trees. And a lot of these were... <laughs> beautiful hardwood trees there. We fell in back and forth across this, and we hauled dirt and put up across and make a corduroy road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bumpy, but it would it keep you out of the swamp. We got the damn grass over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I might have been a... I, I kind of helped with things. I was. We did demolition, and we did all kinds of things. Signal, we helped with that outposts and things, you know. And 
because in the in New Guinea, when you was you had to take care of yourself, every unit would every the unit would be in in the circle here. We'll say we'd have to have guards all the way around because the Japanese could move after night, mm -hmm. and we couldn't. Now I don't know why we couldn't, but we could. Now, I was going to ask you why you thought that was. Well, it just seemed to be the rules of the command. It wasn't. We we set in for the night and dug foxholes, and if the Japanese come through, we got the word, and and it, you you had your rifle and your bayonet with you right there, and it'd be a, <coughs> after dark it'd be a, pretty much of a bayonet deal. I imagine that it, was I imagine it, that was scary. It happened dark. for a few times, but I never had that experience myself. Because to be truthful with you, know, you start with that. I think we walked most of the way after we, we landed on the other side of the old standings and we just walked went up through and <coughs> I had a lot of pictures because uh, <coughs> I never was trained as a photographer, but I had a box camera, and they simple camera, and it mm -hmm. worked in the tropics. Nothing works in the tropics. The batteries don't work at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took pictures, and we were up there for eight, nine months, and then we'd go back to Australia. And uh, they didn't have <coughs> the proper stuff, but they were ingenious. They took postcards that were finished and put pictures on postcards in the mm -hmm. back of the postcard that was uh, unfinished so they could mm -hmm. transfer it on to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had a lot of pictures of New Guinea there, but the I, uh, when, yeah. I, when I came across, when I came over here, well, I filled my car with it and it was, took it on a run, it was too heavy, so I I had the microwave and, and a lot of stuff off, and then somehow or another I le left them pictures there, I guess. Mm, that's too bad. I never found it. Well, I, uh, how would I take a picture of an air fight, you know, with a dog fight? Mm -hmm. P-38s later on. At first we didn't have them, but we had these little tiger cubs that the Australians little single engine things mm -hmm. going around for observation. And once in a while a zero would get after a tiger cub and we could pick him up on the radio and they'd say <laughs> this uh this Australian had another plane evidently to say Well don't get them all, save one for me <laughs> <laughs> Because they could go right around trees and things and the, Zeros that dived down, they was faster, you know, they, they couldn't go. Mm -hmm. they, they could just they could hide slide them. around the tree and come up, and, they'd, and then they'd dive on, and they'd go down. <laughs> so How can I get a picture mm -hmm. of a dog fight? Well, I figured out a way. Here was a group of men standing out there, and uh, a couple of them had their shorts on. We was... <clears throat> We must have been, we must not have been in action or anything, or wouldn't have been. But this guy was standing out there, oh, five or six guys. And they were all looking up like this. And when I got the picture back, <laughs> he had his hand on one of these nuts. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> he was really interested. In uh -huh. <laughs> you know? It really happened. And then, I'm sorry you don't have those pictures. I'd yeah, like to see them. I'd like to have showed you that one. And uh, <clears throat> I just don't know what to happen to them. I, I left all my stuff there in Grants Pass. When I come back from the war, I built a house and got married and had a couple of kids. And uh, so when I left, my wife died in, in uh, July of 89, and uh, I, I've been here three years in November. And then, 
in 90 I got cancer and so I had to have an operation and lost my testicles. <laughs> but I still got a little cancer bud in my prostate. And I take multiple vitamins that keeps that down. Good. Say that. It's, a, it's kind of a new theory, but it seems to be working all right. The thing is, multiple vitamin with zinc or with zinc. Mm -hmm. Now the zinc works on your immune system, and that attacks a cancer thing. So it's I got it down to zero point five and six, and it's going to one time it'll be five, and another time it might be six. But mm -hmm. a zero point zero five. That's pretty low, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But the seed is still there. And, uh, <coughs> I was looking at your arm there, wondering when you got your tattoo. Oh, yeah, in Australia. <laughs> First time you got there, well, this, or that was... This is New Guinea here, see? Mm -hmm. Palm trees? Mm -hmm. Palm trees and this shield and sunset. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of the guys get tattoos? Yeah, yeah I got them. Leopard. You got a leopard on the other shoulder. <laughs> what did you think of time in Australia? Well, I wouldn't want to fight those people in Australia. They're heavy meat eaters and they're big men. Big men. And but they're good. They're fun loving. They love sports and they have a race track in every little town. They have tennis courts and and uh, lawn bowling and parks. We went up to the park, me and a, my buddy, and a couple little kids, boy and a girl, was all dressed up, you know, like they'd come from Sunday school and was on a Sunday having a picnic. And I said, are you children having a picnic? And the little boy said, oh, just a bit of one. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, Did you get to meet any other? I think, oh yeah, they were, <clears throat> I think they were probably 25 years behind America. In mm -hmm. As I could figure. They didn't have railroads interstate. The railroads went up to the state line, and then you had to transfer on to another railroad to go when you, Queensland is down in mm -hmm. No. No, it isn't Queensland. Victoria, I think. Queensland's up in the north. Mm -hmm. but it, every time you went from one state to another, you had to change the railroad. What develops a country is the roads. What developed America was building all these roads and railroads and things after the war mm -hmm. that we get. I-5, I-75, and all these others. We have a good network of roads. We had old six going across. Now we have Highway 40. Boy, you can go across there 70 miles an hour and just let her go on an mm -hmm. automatic pilot, <laughs> so to speak. But this develops a country, and this country wasn't developed. Mm -hmm. I used to go to, I'm talking about Australia now, I guess, so we mm -hmm. just want to talk about it a little bit. I wanted to go to a little town called Yipun on the, on the ocean. We were stationed at Rock. Hampton. <clears throat> the 32nd Division was over here and the 41st Division was over there. Because when the two come together, why well, they didn't get along too well. Didn't get along too well, did <laughs> I can maybe bring that up sometime. But I wanted to go to Yipun. And I didn't have any way to get there. It, there's a head little Tunerville trolley track that went into this little town once in a while, a couple of days a week, something. <clears throat> so I went up to a guy near a camp half a mile away and I said, do you want to sell me a horse so that I can ride into Yapoon on the weekend or something? I was a sergeant. I got a weekend pass once in a while. And uh, well, when I was in Australia, it was rest and recreation and then it, it gets some recruits. Mm -hmm. Three R's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And to go back again. So he said, No, but there's a farm up here. <coughs> it's 
So I went down to this farm, walked another two miles up that other road. And I said, I want to buy a good saddle horse, a good husky saddle horse, because I want to ride him 20 miles to Yapoon, and I'm kind of heavy. He said, I haven't got a horse on the place. I couldn't believe it. He said, I got a buckskin mare with a black stripe down his back. You know what I mean? I said, I know what you mean. That's an ornery son of a bitch. <laughs> with a black stripe, I'll tell you. I don't know why. He said, well, you just get a newspaper and knock hell out of her before you put the bit in her mouth or let her, let her know you're the boss. <laughs> so that's what I did. <clears throat> And she was pretty tough, you know. We'd just take it on a good long trot all the way in. She'd go all the way. <coughs> there was very few soldiers there. Well, there wasn't much of anything left but some German snobs <laughs> on the liquor side, anyway. Is that what you found in your poon, then? Yeah. <laughs> but one night, we, me and my buddy woke up. This was a different buddy. He, he bought a horse too and we both rode in. We left him with a farmer that had been from the outback in Australia. And he boarded the horses and and he, he let us he had a big enough house and we just paid him paid him for sleeping there, so and uh, so one night we got a little inebriated, I guess, and went down to the beach and went to sleep on the beach. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning, there was a an old Airedale sleeping between us. <laughs> sleeping there with an old dog. <clears throat> but we got this jungle rot so bad, under your belts, you know, or mm -hmm. all over. Just, we just call it jungle rot. It's just sores? Sores, yeah, skin. Like a rash kind like of? Or? Like emphysema and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, it just kind of ringworms like and stuff. So they got all kinds of stuff over there, you know. So we'd go down and lay in the beach, and the waves would come in and roll around, and the sand would take that dead skin off, and this salt water would kind of purify it, and I think. Just that salt water just did us a lot of good. Whenever we got back to Australia, I'd try to get to the beach every time I could. A little town like this after dark, <laughs> you take all your clothes off, go roll it out of the wet sand, mm -hmm. pack it on, and rub it all over you. It did a lot of good. The only thing they had for that was gentine violet. <laughs> I think it was just worthless. I think if they had some. <coughs> dandelions or something would have been a lot better. <laughs> Were you taking adabrine or? Um... We took adabrine because we didn't have quinine. Oh, yeah. So that opens up another can of worms. <laughs> our, our eyeballs would turn yellow and mm -hmm. our skin would turn yellow. We had an odor on our body that was out of this world. <laughs> Called the adabrine tan. <laughs> <laughs> All adabrine was, it just Yellow dye. That's what I understood. I'm not mm. positive. Huh? Is that so? I don't know. I don't um, know for sure either. I didn't ever know. Really. But it was pretty bad. Went back to the Hawaiian Islands and <clears throat> on the way back and they said, You've just come from overseas. We'd go up and get a haircut, you know, the first thing we'd do. I said, How did you know that? All the women in Hawaiian, in Honolulu were women. All the barbers were women. We didn't have any choice. But it didn't matter. They were good. She said, you just back from the tropics. You just come back from Philippines or New Guinea or somewhere. And I said, yeah, I was on the Philippines. And uh, she said, well, you'll be looking for one of these ladies of the night. And I want to tell you that if you get a dose, you won't be able to go home for till you you get it all cleared up, it could be two months or six months or something. <laughs> You're going to be here if you do. I said, well, how could I tell? You know, how could I tell whether she's got anything? 
said, you just bring her in to me, dog. <laughs> but I didn't have much luck that way either, so. <laughs> but you didn't get a dose either, so. <laughs> <Get a dose. laughs> Were most of the people in your outfit um, from Oregon? From did the town people stay pretty much together in your unit? Well, they yeah, we did. We was <clears throat> the one eight six was from Oregon. The one six two was from Montana and Idaho, and and some of the other was from California or Washington. Might have been some in Nevada and things. Not much population in Nevada, I don't think. But. At the west coast there and I think mm -hmm. we went in a year before <clears throat> kind of mixing things up here but I don't know that's all right yeah. yeah I was wondering when your when your guard unit was alerted for training uh, before the war yeah that was September the 16th 1940 40 okay that what it says there yeah mm -hmm. I think it was the 16th and uh, so they must have known that we were had some danger, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And why did they let this thing happen like they did at Honolulu? Well, they knew trouble was coming, but they didn't know from where exactly. So yeah. our our general, I think it was, I think his name was White, if I remember right, said, "Japan has the capabilities of coming in this coming down this inland passage, and we would never know they was even coming." This is before the, for the, um, for the Pearl Harbor, Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor, you know, and uh, so I guess they did take a few emplacements up there and dug a tunnel back in the mountain, put a big gun back on the railroad track where they could bring it out and fire it. See, and I have heard, I don't, I don't know all this for whether it's the truth or not, even, but it, that's what I've heard heard that they did come in they did send a small outfit down through there hmm. see see, see where they do things like that don't they you know we trained the Japanese they were trained just the same as we were they had their corporals and their privates and their sergeants and lieutenants mm -hmm. they were all trained by us so here it was <clears throat> two armies fighting you know that from opposite countries, but they were trained. But one thing the Japanese wouldn't do, they wouldn't quit. They wouldn't, if they surrendered, if they got killed, it was an honor. If they surrendered, it was a disgrace. Do you remember the first Japanese that you saw over there in New Guinea? I want to tell you about the first man I saw killed. We got, a, got an airplane went over to Dobodur, I think it was Dobodur. <coughs> it used to be a big plantation, trees, palm trees are just all blown <laughs> And uh, we landed, but the plane couldn't stop. We had to jump out with our gear and roll and <laughs> get a hold of your rifle or whatever, you know. Because when that plane left, what they'd be, the Japanese were on one side, the 32nd was on the other, see. So that's the way we was getting in there. And uh, we got in there all right. <coughs> and we was walking on up, and it's so hot and humid, you know, in the tropics. Oh, I tell you. It's unbelievable. So... <coughs> Some 30 seconds was coming back to get the, to the airport to come to go back to Port Morgy where they'd get a ship. And they'd have the bivouac area that we had, but we didn't bring that with us, you know, the mm -hmm. cook tents and all that sort of thing. They even had a, some trucks over there. And uh, So the 32nd was sitting on one side of this road, sort of a road, wasn't it? Uh, didn't have any cars or anything. Kind of a track? And they were sitting up against these palm trees, coconut trees. So we went up and sat on the other side. 
So they was hot and tired and really, really looked like they had they had, it. They had tough fighting. So they took their helmets off and things and a big bunk and uh, somebody said, my gosh, what's that? And they said, well, this guy over here took his hat off and a big green coconut come down and hit him on the head. <laughs> <laughs> he killed him. Just as dead as if a bomb had hit him, I guess. Well, it sure would have hit him. And especially on the back part of your head. If you hit the forehead, it wouldn't hurt too much. But so that was the first soldier you saw? The first high, soldier right? I seen killed was killed with a coconut. That's bizarre. <laughs> Isn't that kind of bizarre? Mm -hmm. I think with all the training you had, you'd see somebody get killed. You never did see them. But that, that kind of put the fear of God in us. It know. can happen. <laughs> What what job did you have in battalion headquarters? In the well, <coughs> I was a private when I went in, and private first class when I come out. <laughs> I was a supply sergeant and, and uh, a sergeant. Uh, but, uh, I, I was a sergeant most all the time after we went back to New Guinea. And, uh, but like, I, I just want to point out that I wasn't in too many of these tough fights. We got, got the same credit, was in five, what does it say, five, not campaigns, five things. I don't know what you call them. Five, <coughs> five campaigns and seven battle stars. Mm -hmm. And it says on here MOS. Where does it say? Pioneer it? NCO. Yeah. Not commission also. American Defense Medal. Mm -hmm. Asian Pacific Service Medal, Good Conduct Medal, Philippine Liberation Medal, and Bronze Star. Now, I was over there. I was in New Guinea for two years. And we was up there for like nine months and go back there for two or three months and come back up again, see. And it just <coughs> gone from the thing that you're just under so much pressure that this hits round star mm -hmm. and I don't I don't even remember getting what, what I did I don't remember getting that I don't maybe I didn't I don't know so you should have a lot of them didn't but I don't think it pays anything a round star anyway I no think. I don't think so but uh, <coughs> we'll talk about that now. My outfit was getting ready to go to the Army of Occupation in Japan, see, at the last part. So, <coughs> I think I was kind of crazy or something. I'd had malaria 14 times and we had several other fevers, black water fever and dengue fever. Mm -hmm. And uh, but actually what bothered us more was this damn jungle rot that they see. Like in your feet. You could I could look underneath my toes, you could just see the bones. You know. My the bottom of my feet was just White. Just so wet and... Uh, I just wet all the time, you know. You'd be walking along, you'd come up, here'd be a cloud and rain, and it is such a tremendous thing, it just pours. 
you'd be soaked to the bone. Then you walk along for half an hour and you'd be all dry. <laughs> Except your feet would stay wet the longest. You didn't have any soap or anything, no, that's the trouble. And the water, drinking water, was so bad we had to walk. We'd get a, a bunch of natives in there. Then, then they'd take a non-com and, and a couple soldiers to protect the, the natives. And then we'd go back and get a bunch of water cans from the quartermaster back somewhere that's purified or something. And, uh, and she'd have to carry them up. Well, he carried them going up the trail with a 12, 15 natives, you know, and with water cans. And, and it'd be snipers along. There's snipers in the trees. It always ate. They didn't infiltrate, infiltrate. The snipers would go up into a certain tree, or you learned what kind of a tree they'd be in. Some of these, they had these big rubber trees. But the leaves were so big, I don't think there were too many of them, but all kinds of, well, mahogany and stuff. I think we built a lot of mahogany trees in that road. And, uh, <coughs> Seems like, <clears throat> seems like the Philippine mahogany is a little different from other mahoganies that I don't know for sure, but then, that isn't what we're here to talk about. But uh, the snipers, if they would shoot at us, where they were. But if they opened fire, the natives just dropped their cans and hit the brush. You know? yeah. <laughs> so what we'd have to do is go around trying to get the snipers because we'd lost our momentum, you know. We wasn't looking for a fight. We just wanted to get that water back to the troops. And uh, so we'd have to go with the Tommy guns and spray the trees, and spray all around there, and it made the natives feel better. We didn't know whether we... It wasn't important whether we got them or not. They wouldn't shoot again because we knew right where they were. Somebody else would know. Mm -hmm. We'd get them then. But otherwise, it could take you two or three hours to get one out of, a, out of a tree. You'd have to crawl in your belly all in a, in a place where you... <coughs> he would be where he could have a firing range, see? Mm -hmm. So he'd be on that side of the tree. You'd have to figure those things out. <laughs> if you didn't shoot, you'd get killed. I was going to say, did you get better at that as, as get time better, went on? As time was on, yeah. <laughs> So we'd get around on the back side of it and come up, see, mm -hmm. crawling on her belly. You know, but with this thing, we just sprayed these trees with Tommy guns, 45 on mm -hmm. And you just make an egg in the barrel, see, it would uh, air cool this lower part of the outside part of the barrel, see. You just get an egg out in that barrel. Really? I, I haven't heard of that before. They just get so hot, you mm -hmm. know, it just they swell up out in there. And it's real dangerous because if they don't think the bullet could plug up in there, and the next bullet come along and blow the gun up. And they kind of watch that. Japanese pretty well camouflaged up in the trees? Yeah, they mm -hmm. camouflage, they tie themselves up in there. <coughs> if you could get a gun out of a tree, it's good enough, you know, you probably got it. They had. 25 caliber okay. rifle, which was excellent. We had we had 30 odd six. It had a too big a too big a bullet, you know. The 35 had more trajectory, and it would shoot on a lesser plane. It wouldn't mm -hmm. have to go on a on an arc, you know, for distance. It didn't make so much noise, and uh, didn't have to carry such heavy load of ammunition just all the way around. It looked like it was on a 30-06 Springfield frame, you know, with the lever action. But that's that's good because that always works. This automatic stuff don't always work mm -hmm. in the jungle and everywhere else. I imagine it was hard to keep your equipment 
working decently with Oh, them. it was really impossible, you know. We had M1s. And that's gas operated mm -hmm. with the push back and throw the shell out and put another shell mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. But that had to be kept clean. All that thing had to be kept clean. And then that barrel had so much heat coming up and the heat heat waves coming up. Well, you was trying to shoot through that heat waves. Mm. You know, that's kind of bad too, isn't it? I never thought about that. There's a lot of things you don't think about. <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> a couple of points I want to bring up about things that you don't think about. But we we got on to ship somewhere. I think it it's quite a ways across New Guinea. It's a pretty good mm -hmm. size island. It's a big island. And uh, we made an invasion into Hollandia. That's up in Dutch New Guinea. The one part of it is belonged to the Dutch, and the other part was mandated to the Australian, Australian mandated territory, and they had their missionaries in there, and uh, <coughs> they'd have a kind of an overseer, but the, the people in New Guinea were all in tribes, you know, they had these small tribes, and <coughs> What was so amazing to me, they never had any police department, they never had any doctors, no dentists, no nothing, no judge and jury and all. But the elders of the tribe, their decisions, like in the early Bible days, you know, if a man violated a woman, a girl, the parents would bring her up to the elders and they bring the guy up there and they decided it was the truth. Take their machete and the way they do they hold their machete in their hand this way, reach around this other way, and get a hold of the machete. This cut his head around. That's all there was to it, you know. That solves people's problems, you know. And that'll solve his problem. No anyway. jails and no nothing, see. He didn't have any. They, don't, they just don't have any problems with the crime like we do. We're, we play with these criminals, you know. They just take them in there and turn them loose and go and catch them. In the paper here, they find this guy was fifth time he'd been a UI. I think it was yesterday's mm -hmm. paper or today's paper. Isn't that something? It's not going to be that way in the beginning, eh? No, say not. But they didn't live very long. They only lived about 38 years. See, there's a lot of people. I went, I went to the library and read about New Guinea. New Guinea is one of the blackest islands, probably at that time there is. You know, ignorance and mm -hmm. no, no religion, no nothing. Just what the missionaries brought up. And, uh, but New Guinea developed the airplane. Can you imagine that? They had a gold mine way back in the mountains from Lay, I think it's LEA or mm -hmm. something. That was on the coast. Mm -hmm. And they'd have to come down here for supplies. It would take them two weeks to pack in it. They wouldn't allow animals to go up there. I don't know. I don't think they do so good in cavalry or anything. They took some in Australia. <laughs> Pardon me. And uh, take them two weeks to carry supplies back up. Well, this old guy that was running the, had a bunch of natives working for him in his school mine. He took his eye out. He had one eye. Well, that's eye.
stump and said, you boys will have to work. I've got to go down and take this people down and carry up supplies. So it's going to take me two or three weeks to get back. But this I will see. They didn't ever know anything about that. They thought it was for real. If you don't work, this I will see and this I will tell me. So they went around working like the Dickens and because they thought they was under the rule of the eye and <laughs> finally they sneaked up behind this stump and put an old hat over the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if they were maybe going to take a shovel and... and <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this book said it was a hat. Uh -huh. So, <clears throat> the next time he, <laughs> he left the eye out there and told them, now this eye is going to watch you. But you put a hat over here or something because it, he said it couldn't see anything all the time. So he took his teeth out, <laughs> put some, some of his teeth on there. And now if you mess with this eye, these teeth are going <laughs> to... Can you imagine if they see a man take his teeth out? They would just be amazed, you know. <laughs> but I lost all my hair over there. Because of the fever? Or? The first time, I don't know for sure what it could have been. And <clears throat> so, at first there, you know, they did, They had the air power. The Japanese had the air power. I was going to ask you about that. So I, I wanted to tell about that, too. So let's just talk about that. The Japanese had come over to Fort Morrisby at night and we'd have an alert. You could hear their engines, they would be different. They'd go woo, 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 woo like that. Where ours would go woo, you know, kind of steady. Mm -hmm. their, their engine would go like that. I don't know why it was. But there was a ship off the coast of New Guinea there, and they would go out and then turn around and come back and line up on that ship. And they were just bombing the hell out of us. And uh, we had ships unloading. And, and I, I drove a truck for a while there, unloading ships. And, and I had to take a load to the, to the airport. <coughs> so I unloaded some stuff that belonged to them. They said, what do you got on here? And I said, uh, I don't know. I think it's nuts and bolts and nails and stuff like that. It kind of looks like it. So we went up in there and looked and looked like we had a bunch of nails and bolts and stuff. So he said, we need that stuff. I said, it's yours. <laughs> they didn't have enough bombs to go around. Moonlight requisition. Moonlight requisition. Can you imagine somebody up there when they're dumping nails? <laughs> Them nails would be coming down. Oh, they'd go right through a helmet, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Gee, they was they would spike something. They, <laughs> they, they, they couldn't get enough bombs. I think they might have even... They might have been even using some of these old DC-3s as bombers. <laughs> I don't know. Throw the bomb out the side door? Yeah, some way. <clears throat> but, uh, did I get off of that subject? What was we talking about here? No, I was wondering about Japanese air power, um, if yeah. you were bombed and strafed. Yeah, they had bombers coming over, and then they had these zeros, and there was zeros scattered around where mm -hmm. they'd, where they'd uh, got some with the She's got a phone in here, but they're in the aircraft guns or something. Because uh, we wasn't up there too long till we started getting some some more stuff, some mm -hmm. anti-aircraft guns and some anti-tank guns are pretty light and they could could use those for artillery. Some of the other things, they wasn't too heavy, you know. 
Did you did you have the feeling you were short of equipment, or did you have enough? Or we we didn't have the feeling. We just didn't have enough ammunition. We didn't have enough food. We didn't have any clothes. Enough clothes, you know. And boy, in the tropics, they just rot off of you. Had to wear this whole camouflage stuff. It's hard to get to. <coughs> boots? Did your boots last very long? No, nothing lasts long. No, nothing. And anything with a battery in it don't last any time. It just we had these sound power telephones, mm -hmm. and uh, this guy would sit on a bicycle frame and pedal it. Make <coughs> a generator. Make a generator. Mm -hmm. And dollar uh, or else they'd have some some batteries, and also the generator they could. Pedal a bicycle and run a drill for <laughs> for Dennis. For Dennis, you know, <laughs> I had fourteen teeth filled at one time. <laughs> that must have been a real joy. <laughs> well, when you're over there, your mental state. I I don't feel pain, but when I was over there, I didn't feel pain. <laughs> I don't feel pain like other people. I did. I never have shot. Don't bother me at all. Have a low tolerance for pain, is that what you say? High tolerance. High tolerance. High for tolerance pain. Yeah. for pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, but <clears throat> finally they got on to it. How long did that ship have to be hung up up there on the coral reef before the damn powers to be would ever figure it out? Figure it out. They go out and get that off there. And time and time pain. again. And we went on up to the thing, but of course we didn't get much sleep and two or three times a night they'd come over and trying to bomb what air, airplanes we had, but we'd build a we'd build a mound of dirt around like this and park the airplane in between. Mm -hmm. And the mounds of dirt all around. They'd have to make a direct hit, you see, to, to get the airplane. And also <laughs> In one place, an island, I have it kind of ribald is in my mind, not positive. But there was a, a a bay there in a little island. It had coke trees and everything. Finally, this darn island <laughs> disappeared. You know, that was in this little bay. Mm -hmm. It disappeared. <laughs> And then when that thing come back and the, the island come back again, <laughs> it was a Japanese supply ship. Oh. They? <laughs> they had some goats on it and thing. And uh, <clears throat> so then they just bombed the hell out of the, <laughs> the island. So to, you see, we'd have to take some prisoners back. And we'd have to help get some gasoline to the airport, so we was a little familiar with those people, with some things like that. <laughs> I said, did you, did you, did any of these, <clears throat> this last bunch of prisoners that we brought back, did any of them get to Australia? <laughs> you know, they got out of the ocean and they had the habit of sitting right on them bomb bays. <clears throat> He just sat on the bomb base. So they didn't make it back. <laughs> I don't know if, if any of them ever made it back. But we wanted some to get back so they could interrogate. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't tell them anything anyway. We had some Japanese later on, Americans that was able to talk Japanese. Mm -hmm. but they couldn't find out anything from prisoners, that's what I heard. But being in the 3rd Battalion headquarters, we were close to the higher officers, you know, the battalion commanders and things. And uh, <coughs> so that's the way I found out about these things. You might not hear from too many other people. But we had a little trouble with the 32nd Division when we went back to Australia. They, we'd a little bit far one time. <coughs> One time we was drinking in an Australian pub, they call them the pub, 
and their beer is quite a bit stronger than our beer. It's more like wine. It will knock your head off. And, and so, this Mexican kid pulled a knife on the other kid. I think the Mexican was from the 32nd Division. He pulled a knife on the other kid. So I, I had gone to Australia one time when we was back there to a, an armed combat and command training thing, you know, how to take care of yourself and things. And we're supposed to <coughs> take it back to our to our outfits, and he took a bunch of sergeants back there. And we we learned some things there, and come back and and uh, tried to teach them to the company. Some of these people have a little bit of hard feelings in one another. Oh, <laughs> they get lined up and practice these things, so it didn't work very good. <laughs> I do it for real, eh? It's kind of the way things happen in the army, you know. They don't happen very good sometimes. Frequently they don't. <laughs> and, uh... Did you use that unarmed combat in the bar that night? I used it in the bar. That's what I was going to cut. So I grabbed the guy by the shoulders up here, put my foot in his stomach, and he laid down. And then I threw him against the wall. And I did that. But it, to keep from breaking his neck, you hold on to his shirt a little longer so it will twist over. If you want to kill him, you just throw him when he gets up to this point. You, you sure let him go because he'll hit the wall and break his neck, see. And I thought, boy, after I threw him, I said, boy, I hope I held him long enough. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I held him long enough. He <laughs> sure, sure was surprised. That really works. <coughs> then you'd, you'd grab it. A lot of times you'd lay down on the floor. If you was in trouble, lay down on the floor. You'd stick one foot behind the guy's leg and hit him right on the knee. And With the other foot? Yeah. Just break his knee right in two. Just be shoved back the wrong way. <laughs> he, was, he was just completely disabled. And they had these officers had these little sticks. They showed us so many things that comes right between the eyes, right on the nose, that bridge there. Mm -hmm. Or you take that and hit a guy right on the ear. You hit him. Hit him on a certain place on the back of the head to just kill him. And uh, I don't know just where all those little sticks the officer carries. If he knows how to use it. You don't want to tackle somebody that's got a little stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I made me some little sticks and put lead in the end of them, a little broom handle like that, and put them in the car because when I come back, I said, I'll never have another gun. I never, I never had a gun in the house after that. I never Seen enough guns? I didn't want to kill anyone. You had, had to do in, some of that? Yeah, we was in a battle one time. And we drove them into the ocean and they wouldn't, they wouldn't quit. Just shot them right there in the ocean. And <coughs> they brought this interpreter down and he tried to get them to quit. But they, they quit shooting for a little while. And and they'd start shooting again, and you, you couldn't deal with them. We was on a, on a patrol. He was either on a reconnaissance patrol or a patrol looking for a fight, so you know. If he was on a reconnaissance, he was trying to find out what's up here. You wasn't necessarily looking for a fight. But you take a bigger control, patrol, and they'd have an officer in charge. <coughs> So we found the building up there, the native building, it had a bunch of Japanese in there, I'd say 15 or so, and it was too big of a building. They seemed to have somebody in charge there, but I don't know whether it was an officer or not anymore. And uh, so 
so we went through and trying to find any guns and we found a few guns and we told them you can't have any guns we'll take your guns we're not going to kill you or anything and the officer could I think he understood us and he said our leader said make sure that the men know that they can't have any guns and they, if they shoot us that's that'll be all she wrote <coughs> so everything was agreeable and we left and started up the trail and they shot a man so we went back and killed every damn one <laughs> you know that, that isn't a good thing for a man to do is it it's hard thing hard thing to do not as you afterwards sounds like it still bothers you some yeah yeah you never get over it was that in the Philippines or in New well, Guinea that was, that was in New Guinea in the Philippines we left Finch Haven that was up above Alambia and MacArthur had a had a headquarters up in in Finch Haven I think it was and there was a big airport there and they made up a thing when he went back to the Philippines just and uh, we didn't have too much of a fight when we went on the landing at Finch Haven but we went in by the airports to guard the airport it seemed like that was our business but I guess we had a well, what we got, we cut the Japanese off from their supplies, and they never had food and clothes and ammunition or nothing. See, so you kind of overcome this mm -hmm. jungle fighting that way. You can't overcome it otherwise. The same way. They had a lot of bicycles, and and because they didn't have transportation, and they could move on those bicycles. But then, of course. You have to have tires and everything else that keeps it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we found a found a truckload of beer. So we camouflaged it with uh, limbs and things. He's going to come back and see if he'd run. We mm -hmm. <laughs> take it in the middle of the night and be about to camp and get drunk. I guess so. We come back. The damn beer truckload of beer was gone. Somebody else had gotten it. Eh? Well, I'd be afraid to drink that damn stuff anyway. That Japanese beer, wouldn't you? Certainly then I would have. Maybe not now, but then I would have. I was wondering about that. Whether it's any good or not. I was wondering. Kind of a foolish thing to be doing anyway. Well, young people in the military spend a lot of time thinking about things to drink. Oh, yeah. When they're not thinking about ladies. I didn't drink or smoke. And, well, I did. I got drunk a few times. And didn't have much occasion to. Then, <coughs> before we went to the Philippines, we got an opportunity to. We went down to a big bay. They had a. I think it was Milne Bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. There was a big, big rock out here, and ships had to go right in like that and turn this, the, the channel was real sharp out yeah. in there. But after they got in there, they could tie up the coconut trees. <laughs> it was really <laughs> just like mm -hmm. that. And I've seen several destroyers tied up the coconut trees. That's an unusual sight. It's kind of an unusual sight, isn't it? Because we were sent over there to act as longshoremen. This friend of mine, Ed Goshi, from out of Salem, Oregon, was a logger, and his folks had been loggers. And my folks had been loggers, and I set chokers and cut wood and things like that in the logging camp. Just a kid. But I'd been around cables and things like that. 
So we went down there to run winches. They didn't have a winch operator. So these first Liberty boats that came out had steam, steam winches. And you sat right in the middle and you had a, a big arm on each side, you see. Because you had two steam engines. In it. it was a steam engine, but it was a kind of a, like a road, like a big electrical engine or something, but it run on steam. It's very powerful. And you you could control you would you put your line <coughs> One boom would have to be right over the the hole, mm -hmm. and the next boom, the other boom would have to be right over the truck or the barge, whatever he's putting it in, because it was almost impossible to build a dock with it. <laughs> it would have any beach or anything there. But they had a boat outfit, a tugboat outfit, and. Uh, <coughs> So we we got they attached us to a, sh a shore battalion or long a colored company. Stevedores. Uh, yeah. Well, they were they had trucks and oh, mm -hmm. things at that time, and, and they had a PT boat <coughs> based in this in this bay. There was. I think it could have been 20 miles long. It was a big, long bay. It was shallow down at the other end. So they they give us that, and they said to just stay right in our cab, in our tent, and don't don't mess with these uh, colored soldiers at all. Because well, we we obeyed. We didn't do it. But when they, when they put us out on the ship, we was generally out there for several days and they give us food and uh, things like that <coughs> and that was quite interesting because you was coming up with a big load of lumber and here's a bunch of men down there setting lines for you you know and, or if that's anything broke loose there in the way or if you hit the walls or anything there's a lot of men. People in a whole lot of hurt down there. <laughs> yeah. There's always some of these people, smart Alex, you know, that thought, that, man, I'd like to try that, you know. It looks so easy, them things. When you get the load up and then you had to move it over, you'd tighten up one side and let up, slack off, reverse mm -hmm. the other side. And you get over, then you'd have to reverse both of them at different speeds, you know, and things to hold your load straight down here. And they had some ducks, they call them, that two and a half ton, mm -hmm. had sides up that go into the water, had a propeller on them. Couldn't put too big a load on them. We didn't have tanks and things anyway over there. But Wouldn't have been very useful? No, no, not a bit. But in the Philippines, <coughs> they had this Big invasion fleet, as far as you could see, was ships. So we were let, left and <clears throat> I asked a sailor where, where we were headed, and he said, we're headed for Mindanao, the biggest island on the Philippines. And that's where the, because MacArthur put out the word that he was coming back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. He was coming back there with a force and so they went down to this big island, <laughs> and the sailor said, we must be heading right for Mindanao. And I said, he said, you boys must be in for a fight, because they're just loaded with Japanese. So then we changed the course, and you could tell with the sun. <coughs> said to another sailor, we've changed course, where are we going now? I said, I don't know. Just out in the ocean here. So the different ones split up and went in different places. We went into Leyte in the middle of the mm -hmm. Philippines. You got got enough? No, no, no. And uh, <coughs> there was no Japanese, no nothing. <laughs> that was MacArthur, you know. This is all planned by these big generals. MacArthur didn't want to get 
men killed. He said, I've got to have these men to go back to the Philippines with. That's all I got. And I want men to confide. So then we went from island to island, you know. I remember this palo worm. They dug a big trench. And they put these soldiers in and poured gas on them and ignited it, you know, just burned them up. American soldiers, Jeff? Yeah, American Japanese. Japanese soldiers. That was from the left over from Corregidor, and that was either, uh -huh. that's when MacArthur left, when the Japanese took over the Philippines. Well, <coughs> So we had orders, as I understood them, and I'm, I'm sure this is right, that don't take any prisoners, don't bring any prisoners, we don't want any prisoners, shoot every Japanese you find. How did you feel about that? I didn't feel good about that. No, I didn't, I never have. How about the outfit with you? It didn't seem to make much difference to them. But they just uh, kind of carefree. They just don't give a damn anyway. We didn't think we were ever going to get back. Mm -hmm. How about then? Uh, we didn't didn't get into too much trouble that way. We didn't, you know, just little <coughs> little invasion, but. How many islands is there in the Philippines? Maybe a thousand? Yeah, well, 1,400, I think. 1,400. Quite a lot of them. And, uh, did, most, so, did most of the guys you came over with um, make it back all right? Or you lose quite a few? Well, we lost quite a few. But some of them were transferred, too, you know. Some mm -hmm. of them transferred into other outfits. They didn't take me to Japan with them. And I was at a, I don't know, I suppose I was at a kind of a mental state or something. You don't realize these things, do you think? No. I didn't think I realized it. But they said they need some, they need some men down on Mindanao. Where were we at? Well, I don't know. I was on invasion of Mindanao, too. We went off the coast of Borneo, got into a big storm, and lost the destroyer and two or three landing craft. There's a big trench off the coast of Borneo, they say. And we come into this Zamboanga in the fog, and I don't, I don't know how they ever do that. Come into this fog, and here was the, <coughs> when the fog raised up, <coughs> Here was the beach, just all they ready for the landing. You know what they were doing? <laughs> I don't know how they put that fog. That's what. <coughs> now, when were you discharged? August forty-five. Yeah, just before the war started. Mm -hmm. You had malaria <coughs> a lot. Yeah. Did did they put you in hospital when um, when you had malaria? Was well, that? <coughs> At times, but most of the time we didn't even have hospitals there. You, it, it took a lot of Adabrin. You'd take Adabrin until they'd make you sick, and then if you had to go to the hospital, they'd shove it up your <laughs> And, uh, well, thank you. Sweet, and I hope you finish one. And, uh, you think I should tell you about my life in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's that's what I'm here for. <laughs> but anyhow, <clears throat> the Americans they make so many mistakes. Before we made the landing, there was a big cloud come up on the ocean. Just a big black cloud. And you know that damn thing was airplanes. And they bombed this city till there was nothing left at all. They just nothing, absolutely nothing. 
Did you know the Japanese had gone back up in the hill? Dug tunnels and dug emplacements up in there. When the airplanes left, they brought them guns out. And we made the landing. And they just put their artillery shell right in the nose of them landing <laughs> And just blew everything on the hill. Men and everything. Me and another guy, I don't know who it was, picked up this guy. We determined that he was still alive, but he just was shot over the hell in the face. But you know, there's no real nothing. It's just blood and eyes and things. And seemed like it seemed like he just had his half his face shot off. So we took him back to first aid station, and the doctor said. Well, soldier, what's the matter with you? I think the doctor was just in shock. But I felt like you crazy son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm not a doctor and, and I can I tell what's wrong. I think he must have thought he was in shock. But maybe we was in shock too because I didn't. We just picked one guy with one arm, one arm, and took him back. He'd been hit with mortar or I, I, don't know. Or I don't know what the hell it was anymore. It might have even been just a hand grenade or something. I tell you. That's your pastor from Grace Pass on the phone. Well, I told you about transportation, you know, mm -hmm. how it develops the country. And uh, <clears throat> seemed like every family in Australia has some cripples wheelchairs and cripples one way or another. They just, without transportation, people don't get mixed up and you get to marrying your cousins and things like that, don't you think? I think that's a problem. I think that, I think that was a problem. <coughs> and uh, And so this railroad was an example. You didn't have a transportation. I suppose they have now. It wasn't that mountainous. It wouldn't be that bad. But of course, we never had the machinery to build roads either until mm -hmm. after the war, did we? Mm -hmm. yes, we should really thank some of them big caterpillar and some of those people that <laughs> started. Now the mm -hmm. Japanese are making all this big road machinery. You see all mm -hmm. of it. It's all got Japanese names on it, you right. know. And that, that's kind of interesting, kind 15 of years after me, the war. That after that, you know, they <clears throat> when we was going up and down the, the railroad, we'd, we'd come into, I think it was called Brisbane, I'm not positive. It was south of Sydney, and come up through and they'd have to stop for water and Quite a few of them little towns. I don't know where they would burn coal or wood, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> Australia was rich in minerals. Mm -hmm. They never had any oil, and I don't think they just let them. The, the Americans wouldn't let them drill for oil. You know, our American corporation Shell Shell Oil was the main thing over there. They drill a well, and if they found oil, they'd blow it up or something never was able to pump any gas with like four dollars a gallon. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so that don't develop a country either, does it? No, that's true. So we saw this nice little town and <laughs> so when they was taken on water we went over to get a beer and come back the train had left. <laughs> so we only had about twenty, twenty five miles to Rock Hampton something so we we got it was after night we got a hand car and got that on the track <laughs> and we'd pump that hand car up and pumped your way all the way to Rockhampton <laughs> and another time <clears throat> a little town out of out of uh, Rockhampton a ways might have been the same town I don't know but they had a sawmill 
So we want to go down and see what, what the kind of a sawmill they had, you know. And he had ghosts, he'd been a logger, and I'd, been, I'd seen a little bit of it. So we went down there, and <coughs> they had a sawmill of sorts, you know. <laughs> it was antique compared to what we had. And they said, uh, this is the main thing we wanted to show you, this planer. They had American planer. And this is such a marvelous machine. So I said, if this machine is so marvelous, why isn't it working? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, we run the mill all week, and then four or five hours we run the stuff through this machine that's all sanded. <laughs> mm -hmm. They was, had the horse, big old Perkins and Clydedale, and they'd hook it onto this little little tracks, some of them had tracks and some of them had just wheels. They'd put the lumber on these wheels. And it'd be two big, <coughs> larger wheels or if it was on the rails, it wouldn't. If it was, if, it was, if they were pulling on the, on the rails, it'd be a horse on each side, but if they was pulling just on wheels, it'd just be one horse. Because some of them big clients, they had a foot as big as this table it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a little bit. Yeah, the biggest right. placement, though. <laughs> but he said, "We'll we'll take you up and show you some. We planted some trees." So they took us up in an old car, twenty-three Chevrolet or something, <laughs> and uh, up on the side hill there, they planted these trees, and they planted them just like an orchard. But <laughs> 30, 40 feet apart, you know, and they just come up with leaves just like Christmas trees. <laughs> they didn't know any more about forestry than anything, did they? <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot to learn. You could have taught them. <clears throat> yeah, but they can't, <clears throat> can't teach people anything unless they want to know. That's true. That's true. true. <laughs> I think Maxine wanted to, did he tell you about this time? We went back to Maryville there, and I think Ed and I. So we was drinking in a pub, we call them pubs, you know. And we was getting a little bit, had about enough anyway, but there was a couple of women there, and they said, well, they're just about to shut on, so why don't you come down to our house? It's just down the road away. Have a few drinks. <laughs> so I wondered, well, what are, what are we going to get into here? Ed said, well, we might get a little of that or something. I don't know. <laughs> Can't tell what's going to happen. saying this very mm -hmm. loud for that thing. <laughs> So we had a couple of drinks down to their house, and you see, the first battle we had to fight was the Battle of Melbourne, mm -hmm. and there was about 15, 20 women for every man. <laughs> <laughs> the English had sent them all their younger men to Africa, you know, right. fighting Africa over there. They were just some old men and some kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when it comes right down to it, you know, these women is practically the one won the war for us because we was over in New Guinea and we didn't have clothes, we didn't have ammunition, we didn't know they had enough food. And you can't live off the land over there. You take them coconuts, they're just laxative as hell <laughs> when they're green. That pulp inside isn't this is all dried, and they say, that's the wrong way to eat it. You folks don't eat bananas and coconuts like the right way. They just spoon this stuff out and eat it. But that is so laxative. <laughs> not for Americans. <laughs> not, for, not for Americans. And uh, <clears throat> so this lady that I was with said, 
I'll be back and I'll be back. I gotta go down here. So she went down the hallway. And I don't know where Ed went with his girl, but I don't know. Pretty soon she was saying, Yank, Yank, come and help me. Yank, come and help me. <laughs> so I walked down this hallway. Uh, it sounded like it coming out of this door, so I opened the door a little bit. <laughs> she said, Yank, come and help me. She forgot to put the seat down. <laughs> so when she sat on the toilet, I guess she got stuck. Her, her feet was <laughs> up in the air. So you were a gentleman and you helped her, did you? No, I didn't. I just, I just turned around and I left. I went back to the hotel room. I just left. Left her stuck. I said that was the novel thing to do. Left her hung up. She, she was probably hung up like a plunger. Well, maybe Ed helped her out. Maybe. Yeah. Do you keep in touch with any of the people? Did you keep in touch after the war? <clears throat> well, after the war, they just pretty much went in all different directions, and my folks went to Grants Pass, 30 miles out of Medford, where I graduated, and had a little farm out there. So, The Medford, I'd, I'd get over to Medford every once in a while and try to find some of the boys and they'd say, oh, you don't want to see him, he's just a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so many of them were just alcoholics and things when they come back, they just went crazy. They were okay when they went over, but it was the war that did it to them? Oh, it's a... Uh, I think it's a mental thing. They take these dogs and train them for to be war dogs, and they help a lot. They help the men to live and get back to bad places, things. And then they have to deprogram them when they come back. They don't do that with a soldier. I had a uniform and six hundred dollars in my pocket. Oregon paid six hundred dollars the soldiers. I had $900 coming back with $600 only paid. I was overseas for four years and in the service for, well, just about five years. It wouldn't mm -hmm. have been, I didn't have been in August, September. And uh, <coughs> If they'd have deprogrammed the soldiers, it'd have been so much better. I went down to Portland in a truck, you know, they took a bunch of soldiers down. Boy, cars are going this way and that way. Portland, that was a busy place, shipyard building and stuff like that. Shipbuilding and all that industry around there. I was scared to death. I had a Uncle and a aunt and a cousin in Eugene, Oregon, that's a couple hundred miles uh, south of Portland. And <clears throat> I went down there and stayed for a few days. I was just completely disoriented, you know. Couldn't get my bearings. And I remember what my folks looked like, or, you know, I just wondered. What will I do when I get home, you know, what will I do? So I got the phone number. Went down on the bus and called up and said, we'll be in to get you. So I was, uh, <coughs> I weighed 225 when I went over to Australia. I weighed 140 when I come back. So they said, just, just keep this malaria on hand, you know. <laughs> 